Welcome to another edition of Arts and Ideas with Sue Swinan. This program focuses on the many cultural events and fine artists in our community whose works and ideas enrich our lives. Hello, I'm Sue Swinan. We're in the Contemporary Gallery at the Worcester Art Museum today and looking at the work of sculptor Rona Pondick. And I'm delighted to have with me the curator of contemporary art, Susan Stoops, who will be discussing the work in this exhibition, uh, which is called The Metamorphosis of the Object. So Susan, thanks for joining thank, us. And thank you very much. It's a pleasure to have a chance to talk with you and to uh, talk about Rona's work. When, before I begin, I want to tell you that I think this is a stunning show. And I also want to congratulate you and thank you for the work you do bringing this caliber of work to uh, central Massachusetts. And uh, I realize the museum has made a commitment to contemporary art in that regard too. And supporters like Don and Mary Melville, they make it happen. And it's, it's wonderful that we have this right in our community. Thank you. How long have you been uh, a curate, the curator of contemporary art at the museum here? It'll actually be 10 years this fall since joining the museum. And as you were kind of introducing the fact that the museum has this commitment to contemporary art, that's really the reason I'm here. Um, a curator needs that kind of support to be able to do what I do. And uh, certainly the Melville's um, initial gift to endow a program in contemporary art here made all the difference in the world. It means that there's an ongoing presence of contemporary art um, that doesn't wane when things get tough, uh, you know, one way or another, or when there are different people, um, you know, who are managing And programs. you can plan ahead. You can have sure. things in the works, which is absolutely necessary. Well, I think also more importantly even is, or as importantly, is that our constituents, our audiences, our funders, artists, you know, everybody comes to expect us to be doing great work in we contemporary We expect to see something wonderful here, and we do. <laughs> so um, you also run another very wonderful project in the museum, which has gotten a lot of area attention, which is the wall at WAM. Could you uh, tell people a little bit about that who might not know it? Certainly. It's actually a wonderful adjunct uh, program. Uh, you know, we have the, the temporary exhibitions that take place in this gallery, the contemporary gallery. But the wall at WAM is a series of temporary projects that takes place in perhaps the museum's most public uh, space, the Renaissance Court. Um, there is a 67-foot expanse uh, wide by about 17 feet high that's on a second story. Um, and that becomes the um, template for new works that are commissioned about every one to two years by artists from around the world. Uh, it's, a, it's a great way for the program to actually uh, show how it is a laboratory for art making. Um, the contemporary gallery oftentimes, more often, has work that's already created in the artist's studio and then comes together in the, um, you know, in the, in the gallery. With the wall project, it's a commission not only for new work, uh, but it's also site specific. It also takes into account the the history and the majesty, really, of that space, the scale, certainly, and also the ephemerality of, of the project. The project that we have now is the seventh um, in the series, uh, and it's the first time, actually, that we've had art artists collaborative do the project. Their collaborative name is Think Again. Two artists, S.A. Bachman and David Atya, um, who come together and uh, uh, share their talents and make work that is oftentimes uh, multimedia in nature, as this is. This is also, I should say, too, that this is the first time the Wallet Wham has an exterior component as well. I love that. So, in addition to having this mural space, this 67 foot mural, um, there is also a projection on the facade of the museum on the Lancaster Street facade that takes place uh, on the third Thursday of each month, which is, um, you know, kind of the finishing. Uh, component of this of this project. It's a wonderful thing that keeps that space so fresh. You walk in there and it's wonderful. How about uh, giving us a little background on Rona Pondick? We, uh, we're in her exhibition here. So tell us a little bit about Rona. Um, I'll tell you about Rona in terms mostly of my uh, coming to know her work and then coming to know her. Uh, I was fortunate um, in my previous position as curator of uh, 
art at the Rose Art Museum at Brandeis to be a part of an acquisition of Rona's work in, the, I would say, it's in the mid-90s. And um, during the late 80s and the decade of the 90s, uh, Rona uh, became quite um, a presence in terms of her work, which was oftentimes um, installation oriented, um, sometimes uh, uh, more single object sculpture, but usually working with multiple units, multiple was that, objects. Was that the period of those little pink heads? Just like the piece that we had installed in the previous exhibition called Treats. There were Treats. 350 of these little heads. I, I have to say that piece stuck in my memory. I never forgot it, and I think that was my first experience of her, and she was on my radar after that because it was it was horrifying and humorous at the same time. Exactly. It, was, it just really had a very big impact. Well, what's fascinating, too, is that this body of work that Rona was doing um, had a very figurative presence, even though it didn't depict the human body in its entirety. Uh, some of the work uh, was mostly found objects, not all. Um, she used baby bottles. Uh, she used old shoes. Um, uh, in addition to these heads, which the only feature they had was this grinning row of teeth. So a lot of her uh, imagery is really very strongly related to art history and mythology, that she has this broad background and experience with the history of art. Yes, and she, uh, she displayed that again for me. Uh, she shows uh, regularly with Howard Jazersky Gallery in Boston, and on one of her trips to Boston, um, we had kind of gotten in touch and said, hey, why don't you make a stop in Worcester now that I'm at the Worcester Art Museum and I'll show you what I'm up to. And I think at the time, actually, when she made that first visit, we had um, the uh, Masker Mirror Portrait Show, which was my first um, uh, attempt uh, curatorially at marrying contemporary works to the um, collection, the historic collection here at the museum. So she came and see that, but more importantly, really, was our walk through the galleries. and. Her excitement and the way that she looked at the historic sculptures in the museum, it was absolutely fascinating. And it, it led to many, many more conversations about, about her work and about the museum's work. And actually, it also led to her uh, telling me that when people used to come into the studio and look at her work, they were really miffed at what they were looking at. You know, um, they, they weren't quite sure how things were made. They didn't even recognize that it was her, even though these, the human parts of all of Rona's sculptures are cast directly from her, which I found, you know, again, it was, it, was, uh, it was room for a larger discussion for us to go on. We should probably take a look at some of the work, and uh, let's move over and take a look at some of the installation. That'd be great. Well, here we are at the uh, opening display of this exhibition, and I want to talk a little bit about the underlying concept of this show, because it's very innovative and very exciting to see these objects in the way you've displayed them. So could you tell us about the uh, idea of the show? Certainly. Um, unlike any other consideration of Rona Pondic sculptures, this show um, uses Rona's sculptures really as a lens for looking at the world history of sculpture, uh, world history of sculpture as it exists at the Worcester Art Museum. Um, so all of these objects are from the Worcester Art Museum collection? All the historic material belongs to the Worcester Art Museum, yeah. So, you know, it's twofold. It's a way of, of uh, looking at Rona's connections to the past, at her work's connections to the past, because hi art history really does feed her. And also it's a way to look at the historic objects outside the very uh, uh, sometimes narrow, confined, limiting historical confines in which we right. typically see them. We have one them. way of looking you know, at them, which that's the way museums usually display and think about and share their objects. So temporarily, anyway, it's both unlocking these objects from the historical confines and a strict historical iconographical way of looking at them. But it's also unlocking Rona's pieces from her own time too, because normally her work would be seen just in the in the context of contemporary art making. Right. Um, you know. And so you begin to see these connections. By the way, this is Rona's piece here. And this, uh, these other pieces, of course, come from varying cultures around the world. Yeah, we worked, Rona worked, uh, made selections from uh, the um, Asian collections, from the Oceanic collections, European collections here, and really was thinking about uh, ways that the 
uh, that the pieces speak a language, almost like a body language, with one another. Um, when Rona started making this, these hybrid pieces, as we, as we refer to, to them, she um, had this hybrid, hybrid meaning, meaning the uh, combination the human of animal or human plant hybrid. Um, you know, she had to look back even more carefully at the history of sculpture to see how, how other artists tackled certain problems. Um, and one of the things that she started realizing was that there is this communicative capacity of objects by virtue of their gesture or posture that tells you something about what these pieces mean outside of their initial historic or cultural um, context. That, it, that it's somewhat universal. And certainly this first display with the Thai Buddha, with Rona's yellow stainless steel dog, with a pre-Columbian uh, male seated figure and an Egyptian uh, seated figure, all of these very frontal, rather symmetric um, or, uh, pieces, which are very composed, uh, very straightforward, very directed, upright, very regal, facing. forthright maybe. Yes. You know, you can think of a lot of different adjectives. It's almost architectural as you walk through the door to see these four pieces greeting you with this formal stance and this frontal, like one of those temple guardians or something. And the other thing that I think becomes visible right away, and we wanted to have happen right away when you walk in, in, into the gallery, is the material language that all the artists have been working with. You know, whatever material they chose to work in, whether it was bronze or stone, limestone, terracotta, to have that, that physical presence of the material really speak loudly and clearly to everyone, rather than anonymous and the century in which it was made or where it was made, but to really have it be more of a physical, visceral kind of way of projecting meaning and also for you and I to understand meaning. I think there's another interesting thing to bring out about this exhibition, and some of you might be surprised if you come see the show, but there are no labels. And the point of that is, uh, is very specific, that the artist intended that the viewer respond personally, individually, authentically, instead of having to read how you're supposed to respond. So when you come in and experience these, it's almost like you, you sense it with your body. You sense these strange relationships. You, you feel it in your bones more than looking for some explanation in your mind. Well, it's really an alternative way of understanding art and certainly an alternative way of understanding sculpture, no matter where the sculpture is from and what it's made of. But in this case, the unifying aspect is that it's all figurative sculpture. Which is, which is a very important thing to, to make note of, too. And the use of mythology, I think, is wonderful in some of these pieces. And looking at the way in myths, so many of the creatures were transformed and given animal powers and wings and exactly. things like that. Well, that, that, that word metamorphosis that uh, Rona has uh, chosen for the, in, be in the title of her show, you know, applies not only to her work in terms of this very seamless transition from the animal body to the human head, or from polished metal uh, to a more detailed um, uh, casting, but also to those transitions in scale, sometimes within a single piece, sometimes in, uh, from object to object, mm -hmm. um, and also uh, changes in material, and how all of those things impact meaning. I, I have to credit my colleague, Patrick Brown, who is our exhibition designer, who worked very closely with Rona and I over the last couple of years. Rona and I have worked on this project on and off for about six years. Patrick became a very, very key um, uh, colleague in terms of helping us to um, uh, frame these groupings that Rona wanted to create. She made this overall selection of objects, thinking about the juxtapositions one to one. But there are several, uh, like this particular grouping, there are a couple of other groupings that emphasize her interest in gesture and posture. There are a few other groupings that emphasize her particular interest in how artists have represented hair. How do you represent something so fine in something so hard as wood or stone? We'll have to talk about the scanning of her head. That would be nice to look at now. We will do that. Good. I know that Rona has been using repetition in her work for many years, but it's intriguing to see how she has incorporated this new technology that she uh, has access to with the computer. How, what, what's that, uh, how's that working? Well, it's a fascinating segue kind of from her previous body of work to this body of work and also to another grouping. She was very interested in looking at how repetition 
the repetition of an image has happened historically in very different contexts and how that really changes your relationship to a head, for instance, if there's more than one. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's less of a one-to-one -one, uh, relationship. And I think that that all had a lot to do with Rona when she re realized um, that she was able to change the scale of her head by having it built with a 3D computer uh, uh, rapid prototyping. This technology is just fabulous. I mean, it's so amazing. I can hardly grasp it. Well, she feels the same way in terms of the impact that it's had on her work. And so she wanted to maintain the, uh, the detail that she had from the life cast that she so made. So a life cast is literally her head being cast in yes, rubber. Yes, in a silicone material that captured as much detail as possible. Yes, yeah, so all the heads in the exhibition on her sculpture derive from that one life cast. Let's take a look at this one for a second. Uh, this, for example, is the life cast a, 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 a casting of her head that was made into bronze from the life cast. Is exactly. That correct? With the addition of, as you'll see in the earrings, it's kind of this cannibalism almost of, of herself uh, with these uh, decreasing in scale imitations, the, the exact image of Rona's head, uh, which she was able to do with the aid of the computer. And of course, once she realized she was able to keep all the detail the same and, uh, and manipulate the scale, she began doing that. And she also then decided, well, if I can make my head small, what would happen if I made, wanted to make one of my body parts larger? Yes. So there's that whole imaginary, fantastic aspect to it. But I think I'm just going to reiterate, because people might not really understand, that she, from the life cast of her head that was taken by coating her head with rubber, the computer is actually scanning her head with uh, coordinates in yes. three dimensions. Yes. And then it is able, I like to say, print it out. Well, that's, that's correct, it, actually. It runs this, it's like a... It's almost uh, like an inkjet printer, it, but it's in 3D. So it when builds the object by going back and forth. It builds it in three dimensions. Yeah. And the other thing is, when we talk about the scaling and going from this size of her head to the smaller and smaller, it, it's kind of like using a different font size. You know, you say you s select the font at 32 and then you select the font, font at 10. Mm -hmm. And you get the same exact thing, but at different scaling. Mm -hmm. And of course, nature is full of scaling. Of course. It exists in well, every... and one of the things that she, uh, she thought of was when she saw her head at a reduced to about a quarter of an inch, she thought of it, oh, that looks an awful lot like a bud on a tree or yes. a plant, which she then and went to that uh, to exploit that very subject matter in another in a couple of other and series those of pieces. and the pieces with the trees with the little heads on them. It's they're so they evoke so many meanings and possibilities, you know, of these strange fruits and buds. And, and I think some people don't realize until you get really close and inspect you don't the even notice that, that the little heads are on there. One of the first. things that we really were happy to do and wanted to do uh, all along in the show was to have um, on view uh, some of the uh, documentation, you might say, object documentation of the building of the sculptures. So we do have the plaster. Uh, the life cast here, the life cast where her head uh, has the hair removed because remember the computer can't scan hair which is why Rona had to turn to artists like Donatello to look and see how did you carve hair that incredibly. Uh, we have that, we also have, it's fabulous, we have one of the enlarged hands that was used for the piece cat. It's 18 inches it, it's been enlarged to but we've got the thermoplastic hand that was built from the computer itself. And you can almost detect the little layers that are in that piece. I noticed she mm -hmm. wanted that to if be visible. If you look visible. carefully, you can see the yes. build marks, and it's an awful lot like the topology that you see in wood. It is when like you look at the or at on, the, uh, a, on the landscape. Exactly. So you yeah. see the growth over time. Look at these uh, wonderful little heads repeated in this figure, and uh, the way that creates meaning and... Uh... Well, she was fascinated, you can imagine. She had made her ram's head already when she came to the Worcester Art Museum and saw the canon, um, the, but was uh, absolutely fascinated by the use, a similar but different use of multiple heads on one figure. And how that changes, again, your relationship to the head that's life-size compared to your relationship to the heads that are uh, scaled differently. Mm. I love the use of the high polish with the, uh, 
with the matte finish of the skin and the way she's rendered that. Let's look at some of the pieces that are uh, at the polished chrome, well, uh, stainless. Polished stainless, yeah. yeah. Mirror finish. Yeah. Mirror finish. I'm really intrigued with the way she uses materials for such expressive ends. And uh, so, so this is uh, a polished uh, Stainless? Is yes. That, yeah. Tell us about yeah. how her yeah. process uh, creates that kind of surface. Well, Otter is a great example for uh, looking at uh, kind of what Rona's done with a, with a number of these pieces, both in terms of the the, uh, the hybrid image itself, but also the use of a polished area combined with uh, kind of a skin texture in the case of the, the human hand. Um, and and the also face. Rona's face. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and also how she manipulates scale. I mean, you know, she, she takes a lot of liberties. It, the, you know, she works from animal models um, uh, to, to sculpt by hand, but in this case, really, she elongated this otter's body. Sure. And, and also, um, when- I love the way the shape expresses this weight of the animal's body, well, you know, she, like a liquid drop or something. And the liquidity, actually, this fluidity, um, it's not only a fluidity of meaning that she kind of finds very provocative in terms of having these juxtapositions of her objects and all these other objects together in this room. There's this incredible fluidity in, in, in that. So that but the also, meanings change yeah. from moment to, yes. Yeah, and as they change, you know, artistic uh, uh, ideas are shared and cross-culturally and cross-generationally. You know, her, uh, that, that liquidity makes me think of uh, her infatuation with and also the way she's learned so much from Brancusi's work, who, um, as you know, was a master at uh, the uh, mirror uh, stainless steel finish. And those beautiful organic shapes. And well, and, and Rona has said that using, using that kind of finish, it becomes a little bit more abstract, a little bit more generalized. It's like something moving really fast. She says it's kind of like having a car that goes by really fast. You know it's a car, but you don't know like what kind of car it is, the specific kind yeah. of model or something like that. And, and the with, shape is fluid. It's like, I, think, I think it was George Fifield said it's like, it's like fluid um, mercury, like exactly. liquid mercury. Yeah, yeah. Um, and with, with Otter, so she, she, she uses, you know, that, um, that mirror finish also as a way to open the figure up to the rest of space. You know, it reflects us, it reflects our environment. Mm -hmm. And compared to, if you'll notice, with her heads and her face, which are much more introspective, that interiority, which is part of uh, a byproduct of when you have your eyes closed for that life cast, but also there's this psychological kind of interiority, I think, with the human head and all of these pieces, where the body of the animal is really projecting more out into space, emotionally and physically into space. And that use of the mirror finish, I think, really helps accomplish that. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, it's, to me, it's fascinating to see how uh, at one moment, the mirror finish of the stainless jumps out at you in this exhibition, and, and at other times, it actually plays off of the color and the material of the other sculptures, mm. which are very unlike Rona's. You were talking about gesture being so important, too, and I think the gesture of this otter, the way that head uh. just crinks in that kind of painful position and and it, the, the strange size of it on that body and then that little teeny hand there, it, yeah. it really speaks so much emotionally to us. Uh, I, I mean, we come to it more in terms of the, the, the human, uh, you know, uh, feelings, emotions, psychology, don't yes. we? I mean, we do. Yes. And one of the ways that, we, that Rona has is, uh, makes that effective is not only obviously with the human head and human face, but even in this case, she later added, she decided to add that human hand so that there's the otter paw and the human hand and, and even the position that they're in. She said something to the effect of, you know, when I a added that human hand, it really made this otter even more pathetic. It is, it has a great pathos about it. So there's some it. empathy, don't something that we Something about have. the contemporary life or something. It's oh, I think very much, yeah, very it, much. Really, and the other thing I think would be worth mentioning is you know, her whole idea of how the materials themselves can create meaning and her use of the materials and how, when we were saying no labels, how each individual kind of experiences and receives that impact from the material and the sculpture 
in their body. Exactly. You know, you, you understand it in your body. Uh, you respond to those materials in a different kind of visceral way than uh, having one correct answer for what is the meaning of this piece that might be, you know, a more uh, uh, mental exercise, whereas these, you feel them. Mm -hmm. Uh, I agree. That's let, a great interpretation. Can we look at the, uh, I want to just get a peek at that uh, fox with the large head. That's great. one of my favorites. Part of why Rona's pieces are so successful is because that transition uh, is really seamless from animal to human and also from the mirror finish to the skin textured detail. And I've come to think of those her works as believable fictions. That's, what, that's how I like to term them, which has also led me to think that that may be an accurate description of most of these sculptures in the show, not just Ronis, but the historic ones too. Because artists have always been dealing with that relationship of the real and the imaginary. Exactly. They have to navigate from those two extremes, right? There's a lot of abstraction, there's a lot of representation, and it's fascinating to go through the show and actually just think about it in those terms, or to pick out a body part maybe and look at how artists translate that. How little detail or how much detail do you need for something to actually be believable? For me, this one with this huge head hanging down like a boulder you know, it, it just is so expressive of the difficulty of holding that head up with this elegant little animal. You know, the expressive quality is there in the form, which I love. And it's, and it, and it's in position for us in this exhibition a little bit differently than it is normally, because you might usually see this fox piece on the floor, but in this case, you're coming face to face with the head. Right? Insulation so it really, makes such a big difference, so it really especially in this the experience show. A bit too. So when is this show ending? The exhibition's up through October 11th. And Rona will be here to yes, speak. Yes, we're happy that she's going to be here September 23rd. We do recommend people call and make reservations if they're interested in coming to hear her talk but about the project. But that's free and with your it's museum free, admission? Yes, with museum admission, open to the public, but limited reservations just because of space. So come on by and see this show. It's great. And uh, Sue, I, Susan, <laughs> Sue, Sue, Susan, right. thanks so much for having us. It's been wonderful looking at the objects pleasure. with you. Pleasure to look at work with you.